Dear Mother, we ask you to bring us closer to Jesus. Jesus, our King, Jesus, our Lord, Jesus, our brother. Jesus, a just judge. We ask you to intercede for us as we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Purgatory. The final purification. A doctrine of the faith. Absolute truth. If you are Catholic, you must believe it. It is not optional teaching. It is essential teaching, as the basic topics that I'm covering in this series. Judgment, purgatory, heaven and hell. Those are basic teachings of our Catholic faith. Very often, uh, very often, someone will say, well, where does it say that in the Bible? Now, that's really not a good question because it really shows that you don't understand divine revelation when you, are, when you ask that question. Uh, you do understand what divine revelation is. It's God's revelation of himself to us in the person of his only son. In other words, the word. The word is not something. The word is somebody, and his name is Jesus Christ. That is the Word who became flesh. That is the Word of God. Almost a million words in this book, this Holy Bible. They can be condensed, distilled, and synthesized into one only Word, the eternal Word, God's Word, Jesus the Christ. In the eternal silences of the Trinity, God our Father spoke but one word, his only word. He has no more to say. Those are the words of St. John of the Cross, great doctor of the church. So, the word of God, the truth, it is transmitted to us in a written form, a spoken form. The written word of God, the Bible. But of equal importance is what we call sacred tradition, the apostolic kerygma. Jesus, when he walked on the face of the earth, didn't write a book. You know that, right? He didn't write a book. Now, the Bible has God as its primary author, that's for sure. But Jesus taught orally. Who did he teach? His apostles, primarily. And then they, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, handed that teaching of Jesus Christ on. That's called sacred tradition with a capital T. It has equal weight with sacred scripture. And so you have sacred tradition, sacred scripture, divine revelation, God's revealing himself to us in a written form and in a spoken form. But wherever you have a word, whether written or spoken, you have to have an authentic an authoritative interpreter of that word, and that is the magisterium of the church. So very often when they say, well, show me that in the Bible, it, ne it isn't necessarily in the Bible, but it doesn't have to be. It could have been transmitted through sacred tradition, the oral teaching of Christ, which the apostles handed on to their successors, the bishops, in union with the Bishop of Rome, the Holy Father. But in this case, the case of purgatory, when they say, oh, I don't believe in purgatory, well, we just happen to have a text from the Bible. And this is the one that, that's always quoted. Well, where does it say that in the Bible? Show me a text in the Bible. Okay, okie dokie. <laughs> Second Maccabees. Okay, Second Maccabees, chapter 12. Verse 38 and following, the great hero of Israel, Judas Maccabeus, leader of the army of the chosen people, 
Ju Judas rallied his army and went to the city of Adullam. As the week was ending, they purified themselves according to custom and kept the Sabbath th day. And on the following day, since the task had now become urgent, Judas and his men went to gather up the bodies of the slain and bury them with their kinsmen in their ancestral tomb. So what happened? Judas Maccabeus had some fallen comrades. Uh, they'd been in combat with the enemy. Some of them had been killed in battle. And so they went to take care of their dead. But under the tunic of each of the dead, they found amulets sacred to the idols of Jamnia, which the law forbids Jews to wear. W what happened? They had sinned. They, they had sinned. That was an idolatrous thing to do. They had sinned. So it was clear to all that this was why these men had died. They all therefore praised the ways of the Lord, the just judge, the just judge, who brings to light things that are hidden. Turning to supplication, now please note what happens here. Turning to supplication, they prayed that the sinful dead the, sin, the sinful deed, that the sinful deed might be fully blotted out. What were they praying here for? They were praying that the sins of those dead men would be expiated, atoned for. What were they doing? They were praying for the dead. The noble Judas warned the soldiers to keep themselves free from sin. For they had seen with their own eyes what had happened because of the sin of those who had fallen. He then took up a collection among all the soldiers, amounting to 2,000 silver drachmas, which he sent to Jerusalem to provide for an expiatory sacrifice. In doing this, he acted in a very excellent and noble way, inasmuch as he had the resurrection of the dead in view. For, if, if, for it were, if he were not expecting the fallen to rise again, it would have been useless and foolish to pray for them. But if he did this with a, with a view to the splendid reward that awaits those who had gone to rest in godliness, it was a holy and pious thought. Thus he made atonement for the dead that they might be freed from this sin. Purgatory, the final purification. What did Judas Maccabeus do? He offered sacrifice, atonement for the sins of his deceased comrades. Why would you do that if it couldn't help them? This is the word of God. Now the church has intuited this to be a text of sacred scripture which affirms the existence and our belief in the reality we call purgatory, the final purification. To reiterate, we die. We immediately stand before Jesus, the just judge. That's the particular judgment. The state of our soul at that last moment is what matters. Uh, where are you at that moment? Not where were you 20 years before that, because you may have been living a life of great holiness and deteriorated, or you may have been living in mortal sin and repented. Where are you at the moment of death? No mortal sins on your soul, but not quite perfect. You have some venial sins. Perhaps you had committed some mortal sins in the past, had repented of those, but the temporal punishment due to those sins had not been fully atoned for in this life. Remember, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. Purgatory is the later. I remember a story from the life of great Saint John Vianney, the patron saint of parish priest. And um, Saint John Vianney had a hard time being ordained a priest. 
he had uh, some difficulties with his studies, but he had a, um, an older priest who helped him. He was his mentor. And this was a very, um, very holy old priest. And I remember the, the, um, the man was about to die, and he had led a very penitential life. And um, he called St. John Van Ayen, and he said, My son, my son, I have a very, very important mission to assign you to. You have to help me with this. I'm about to die. I know that. Now, the people think I'm a very holy man. And after I die, they will probably not offer any great sacrifices and suffrages for my poor soul, and they are likely to leave me in purgatory for thousands of years. <laughs> Therefore, you are to take my instruments of penance, my hair shirt and so forth, and bury them out in the forest. What, what was he concerned about? He wanted the people to pray for the repose of his soul. Now, he knew he wasn't in mortal sin. He was a holy man. But he wasn't taking any chances. I'll tell you what, now that I got you all here gathered in one place, if you ever hear of Father Karapi's demise, <laughs> you better do something about it. Pray for me. You know, have a mass said, say a rosary. Say one memorari. Better yet, do Mother Teresa's emergency novena. Nine memorares. The emergency novena. It really works. You ever hear that I checked out? Oh, you think that's funny. A couple of years ago, my Aunt Louise, who is from Amsterdam, New York, my Aunt Louise, they, uh, she and my, uh, my Uncle Lou, they go down to Florida every winter. And then they come up here in the springtime. Uh, in upstate New York, but uh, she had just gone down to Florida. And they went to Mass on Sunday. And uh, after, the, um, after the homily, and then uh, the, uh, the creed, you have the intercessions, you know, where the, the priest will lead the, the prayers of the faithful. And it, right at the end, the prayers of the faithful, he said, and please, all of you, please pray for the repose of the soul of Father John Corapi, who recently passed away. And my aunt sitting there almost fell out of the pew. She went home in shock, called my mother. Why didn't you tell me John died? My mother said, well, I didn't know. I just talked to him five minutes ago. <laughs> but in case you ever hear it, and it's real, pray for my soul. I don't want to be presumptuous. We need to look out for each other. Purgatory is a reality. Only the perfect, the perfected, can stand in the immediate presence of God. Now, when I get to this part, uh, a lot of people just don't like it. And I don't blame them because I don't like it either. Makes me a little bit nervous, but it is a fact. You have to be perfectly pure to stand in the immediate presence of God. You just can't take that pure light otherwise. If you have any sins, even venial sins, as long as they're not mortal sins, the guilt of mortal sin, any of the woundedness from sin, uh, any of that temporal punishment that you incur due to sin, and that's not been atoned for yet when you die, that's purgatory, okay? Now, what is the, uh, well, let, let me just uh, read to you a little passage that has to do with that. This is from the Gospel of Matthew. You've heard the commandment imposed on your forefathers. You shall not commit murder. Every murderer shall be liable to judgment. What I say to you is everyone who grows angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. Any man who uses abusive language toward his brother shall be answerable to the Sanhedrin. And if he holds him in contempt, he risks the fire of Gehenna. That, that's another way of, of saying hell, right? You've heard that, the fires of Gehenna. You know what Gehenna was? 
That was a garbage dump on the outside of the holy city. Gehenna, that's a, that was a place always burning like, like a dump. You know, they were burning stuff constantly. Probably didn't smell very good either. If you bring your gift to the altar and there recall that your brother has anything against you, not that you have something against your brother, this is worse. If you recall your brother has something against you, leave your gift at the altar, go first to be reconciled with your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Lose no time. Settle with your opponent while on your way to court with him. Otherwise, your opponent may hand you over to the judge, who will hand you over to the guard, who will throw you into prison. And I warn you, you will not be released until you have paid the last penny. And that has to do with expiation for sin, until you are 100% purified. Now, that purification takes place in this life on earth, or and after, in purgatory. Purgatory meaning the final purification. Okay. Every last penny will be paid. I've known a lot of people who have lived less than perfect lives, including myself, uh, who, it seemed to me anyway, had a lot of suffering the years leading up to their death. I always believe it's the mercy of God, and that God loves them so much that he allows them to expiate for their sins in this life, so that when they pass away, that he can get them to himself just as quickly as he can. Very, I believe that. I, I, or, you know, it could also be that these people, having expiated for their sins, are helping other people. Because you know you can do that. You and I, all humanity really, certainly all the church, we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. All the good that I do has an effect on every human being, especially on the whole church. Any evil that I do, any sin that I commit, has a negative effect on the entire body of Christ. The body is one. You know, if you get an infection in your foot, uh, it, it, can it can affect your whole body. Your, your, your whole body starts to feel by it. If the infection spreads, right? So you get a, you get a cut um, on the seashore or something, uh, or you go out uh, by the lake and you, you step on a shell or something, you get a cut and it gets infected. First, you just got an infection in your toe, but the infection could spread. Pretty soon, you just feel badly. You're sick. Uh, not just your toe is sick, your whole body's sick. That's how sin, in a mystical way, affects the entire body of Christ. I have said this many, many times, and I'm going to say it again, almost in tears, at this juncture in history. As the Catholic Church goes, so goes the world. As we succeed in our mission, do you know what the mission of the Catholic Church is? Redemption. The mission of the body of Christ must be the same as the mission of the head of the mystical body of Christ. Why did the Word become flesh and dwell among us? Redemption. That's why. Jesus assumed the human nature, became like one of us in everything except sin for one reason. Redemption. Salvation. That's his mission, that's our mission as well. In so far as we accomplish the mission, we hold the world up. In so far as we fail to accomplish this mission, the world begins to sag and sink into hell under the weight of its own iniquity. Now please think about that for a moment. Take you back to the Old Testament, give you an example. Moses, the chosen people, 
engage in battle with the pagan army of Amalek. Moses, like any good military commander, went up on the high ground. Right? He, he had to go up there to see what, what was going on with the battle. He took his brother Aaron and another one of the priests up there on the high ground, and the battle unfolded before them. Now it says in the Bible that Moses, so long as he kept his arms outstretched in prayer, the battle went well for Israel. But Moses, being a man, grew weary. And when his arms began to sag, the battle went well for Amalek's army, and Israel began to suffer losses. And so it went. Kept his arms up, praying strong, battle went good. Arms got weak, tired, battle went poorly for Israel. Finally, Aaron and the other priests propped up Moses' arms, and Israel won the battle. Now that is what's called a biblical type, a prefigurement of the church at prayer. So long as we accomplish our mission of redemption, so long as we are holy one at a time, your mission is to be holy as your heavenly Father is holy. And you don't have any other mission but that. To the degree that we advance in holiness, we hold all creation up. Evil is held at bay. But when we, we grow weary of doing evil, of doing good, when we're tired of praying, we're tired of a life of sacrifice, we're tired of being virtuous, we just get sick and tired of being religious people and we slack off, what happens? The world begins to sink into hell under the weight of its own iniquity because we are not accomplishing our mission. And I tell you with absolute subjective certainty in my own heart and mind that I know that we in the Catholic Church have been slacking off for some years, many of us, and I can't blame you, I gotta blame me. I can't say anything about you. I just got to look at myself in the mirror and, I, and say, you are a priest. And you should do a lot better than you do. And maybe we're at war because you didn't pray enough. And maybe we got abortion as the law of the land because you didn't do penance enough. Maybe we got pornography all over this country because you didn't exercise virtue to the degree that you should. The problem isn't out there. The problem is in here. And because of it, I'm going to have to pay. I can pay him now, or I can pay him later. But one way or another, I am going to pay for my laxity. To those who have been given more, more will be required. I've been given plenty. I've been given a lot of grace. Therefore, I will be held accountable for what I've been given. That frightens me. But I can't, uh, uh, you know, my grandfather used to tell me how he was in World War I. He didn't talk too much about it. But every once in a while when when we were out fishing, which we did often together, uh, he, he'd tell me a, a story from World War I. He was in, uh, because he, he was French-Canadian, and he spoke perfect French, and he spoke some German, and of course he spoke English, and because of that, they put him in the intelligence service. He used to interrogate prisoners. He used to ride a motorcycle uh, on the front. He was blown off his motorcycle several times by shell concussions, and he'd tell me about that, and he'd tell me how Many times in combat, in World War I, mustard gas, uh, he came in very close proximity to it. He didn't actually get his lungs burned by mu mustard gas. Many men did. Many of his friends did. Uh, he didn't, but he came close. And he showed me, he showed me the, 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 the chaplain corps gave them a little, um, it was a crucifix that folded over. It, it was like um, cloth, and it had the... Um, 
prayer at the foot of the cross. And he used to hold on to that. He said when they were in the trenches and the, and the mustard gas was coming and the machine guns were going, he said, I was scared. But we weren't so scared that we didn't act. We did our duty. I'm scared to be a priest. I, I, I can tell you that honestly. I am frightened to be a priest because I know that I'm not worthy to be a priest. I know that. But I am not so scared that I won't try to do my duty. The machine guns are blazing. The poison gas, the moral toxicity of this age we live in, oh, it's deadly. I'm scared of my responsibilities. I'm a man just like any other man. I'm a sinner. To this day, I can get very angry. You know, the other day, there was a little demonstration, and, and some people spit on an American flag and burned it. I don't like it to this day. I remember being spit on myself in 1968, wearing a United States Army uniform. I should be more peaceful than I am. I should be more virtuous than I am. I can still get mighty angry. That's not good. But I can't use that as an excuse to quit. I am frightened being a sinful man in a priest's clothes. I am frightened of that responsibility, but not so frightened that I'm going to cut and run. And you don't do that either. We are on the battle line. Purgatory is a blessing. We have been called to a high, noble vocation. We are Catholic Christians. We have been given the fullness of divine revelation, the full means of salvation, all seven sacraments. We've been given more. More will be required of us. We may fall short now and then. You and I may be lazy. I don't know about you. Are you, have you, are you ever lazy? No. No, not you too. Now, the Pope, in this time of trial, Holy Father, has called upon every Catholic to pray the rosary every single day. And we ought to do it. We ought to, I mean, we ought to do it. There's power in the rosary. And we ought to be praying it every day. Now, some days are you maybe a little too lazy to do it. Well, uh, you know, I just hand on to you the Nike commercial. Just do it. Some people say, oh, but I'm too tired. Just do it but I don't feel like it, just do it. I don't want to, just do it. Shut up and do it. Why? Because we ought to, that's why. We are relatively few. We are a Gideon's army. We are a remnant. We are those of us who are left, battle-hardened, wounded. We've been knocked down a hundred times, a thousand times. You keep getting up. You have physical infirmities. You have emotional distress. You have moral trials. You have spiritual trials. You get beat up one side and down the other. You get rejected here and knocked down over there. Life is rough. It really is. But you don't quit. When you fall short, when you don't do everything you ought to do, there's a comfort in knowing that God in his infinite wisdom has given us a blessing and I repeat, a blessing beyond our wildest dreams. It's called purgatory. And we don't usually think of it like that, but that's what it is. It's a major blessing. Because without purgatory, you would have to be perfect. I would have to be perfect in order to ever get to heaven.
And that scares me. That really scares me. That I would have to be perfect the moment I die in order to stand before God. But I know I've got a safety net. I'm going to, I've got to do the best I can. But I've got purgatory, the final purification. What is it, though? We go before God. We didn't have any mortal sins on our soul. But we had not fully expiated for the sins we had committed, and perhaps we had some venial sins not yet repented of on our soul. We see Jesus. We see God. That vision is all-consuming. A, a, a love that you can't understand in this life takes hold of you. You see for the first time the beauty and the glory and the goodness of God. And it just infuses you with love. And then you are separated from God. And that is painful. That is painful. The, the separation, however, is temporary. It is not the pain of loss that, we, that, that they suffer in hell. We know we're going to be reunited with God. But imagine, if you will, uh, the person that you love the most in your life. Maybe uh, you husbands and wives, maybe it was when you, when you first knew each other or when you were first married. Uh, you had an intense love, and you couldn't scarcely be apart from each other. And it hurt when you were. I, I, I know uh, men, some of, you, uh, some of you went away in World War II. Uh, some of you are old enough to have gone in the military in World War II. Some of you went in Korea. Some of us went during the Vietnam era. Uh, maybe you were married. Maybe you were just married and you had to go. And, and you know the pain of separation. That's but a dim intimation of that pain of separation. Having seen God, you go to purgatory. That's the major pain of purgatory, separation. But it is not the pain of loss of health because you know you're going to see him again. That separation is only temporary, but it's a very intense pain, supposedly more intense than any pain on earth. It is a purifying, cleansing fire of pain. Now, why that? I believe it's because we didn't appreciate God enough when we were on earth. We didn't appreciate his presence enough. We didn't appreciate his goodness, enough. We took him for granted. Now, I'll give you an example of this. In every Catholic church, just about everyone, I think, most of them, you've got Jesus reserved in the tabernacle, the Blessed Sacrament, right? The Holy Eucharist. Now, that is Jesus Christ. That's, just, that's not just a symbol of Jesus. That is Jesus. Body, blood, soul, and divinity. That is a gift beyond your wildest dreams. That is Emmanuel, God among us. That God our Father would allow his only Son to remain with us under the appearance of bread. That is a gift beyond our wildest dreams. But who bothers to spend any time with him? Not many. Not many. And it's that kind of indifference that we'll one day have to atone for. And that, that pain of loss. See, we, we, right now, we haven't seen him face to face. Blessed are those who have believed and not seen. You know, Thomas, Thomas said he wouldn't believe until he saw, until I put my fingers in the, in, in the nail holes. I'm not going to believe. Do not persist in your unbelief, but rather believe. But blessed are those who have believed and yet not seen. We walk by faith, not by sight. All these things are requirements for the Catholic Christian. When we fall short, we're going to pay now or later. I truly believe a great many people atone in this life for their own sins and for those of others, family members and so forth. I believe a lot of good people are given good long lives, and they do seem to suffer an awful lot, not just for their own sin. I know people 
who, who never really committed any terrible, big, huge sins, but who seem to suffer an awful lot. They're like Job. They're like Jesus, who, though perfectly innocent, suffered. Why? For others. To atone for the sins of others. I'll tell you a story. Last time I was here, last time I was here in Buffalo, Friday night, right? I finished talking Friday night, went back to the hotel, and my friend, my, my daughter, my office manager, Tamara, took me aside and said, I got to talk to you before you go in your hotel room. I said, well, what? I'm, I'm tired. I want to go to bed. She said, no, I got to talk to you first. I said, all right. She said, your dad passed away today. That was two years ago, September 8th, 2001. You know, and they said that you could leave. They understand if you leave, you got to go home and attend to that, and you probably don't feel so good now. I said, oh, no, I could just imagine my father, if I had cut out on a mission because he had passed away. He'd have haunted me for the rest of my life. He was always asking me if I was yet gainfully employed. <laughs> and now that I finally was, I'm going to cut out on the mission early because he had passed away. Well, I did the mission, of course, finished it, and then I flew home, and on September 10th, 2001, got on an airplane and flew from San Francisco down to Los Angeles. This is right after I'd left you last time. And then you know what happened the next day. I buried my father September 11th. That, yeah, the September 11th, that's right, 2001. 5.15, Tamara called me, said, turn on the television. I saw the events of September 11th live on television. I saw the second plane hit the second tower. I saw that. And then I went to the funeral home. I went to the chapel. And there was my father's casket, right in the middle of the nave of the church, chapel. And it immediately jumped out at me. There, there was a, an American flag and a crucifix on his casket. And it immediately leaped out at me that my father had fought in two wars and served two countries. Fought in World War II, was in the Navy, fought in the South Pacific with the Seabees. And then later in life, he served his heavenly homeland in a different kind of a war, a spiritual war. And redemptive suffering was the weapon he used to defeat the enemy and bring down grace, not just on himself, expiating, no doubt, for the sins of his own life, but also bringing down grace on his priest's son. Very few of you have experience what I have when my father, having heard me preach for a couple of days, said, you got a minute for your old man? And I said, sure, Dad. And he said, I want to go to confession. And he knelt down, and I heard these words come out of my father's mouth, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's 50 years since my last confession. And afterwards he said, you know, I'd, I'd give anything if I could have been a better father. And I believe God heard that as, as God hears a prayer. And, and my father immediately began to suffer. Over 30 surgeries in the last seven years of his life. Three open heart surgeries. Surgeries on his eyes. Surgeries on his spine. Surgeries on his hands. Over 30 surgeries. In the last two years of his life, he was in constant pain. He was in so much pain that he couldn't lie down to sleep. He had to sit straight up in a chair all night and try to rest for a couple hours at a time. He never complained. He was fighting a good fight. Pay me now, pay me later. He was paying a price. For his own sins, perhaps. Perhaps for mine. Perhaps for a multitude of other people. I would have done anything, Lord, if I just could have been a better father. God can do in an instant what a thousand years of human effort cannot accomplish. Yes, 
You can pay me now or you can pay me later, but that payment isn't a negative, it's a positive. You don't believe it, you take a good long look at a cross. That's a plus sign, brother. That's a plus sign. That's no negative, that's a plus sign. Redemptive suffering is positive, not negative, and the only requirement is that you be in Christ, in grace. That's a great blessing. And purgatory is a great blessing. Can we pray for the souls in purgatory? Of course we can. We offer masses for them. Can that affect them? Yes, of course it can. I'll tell you a little story. You don't have to believe this. And, and you know, it doesn't mean anything. This is not a doctrinal thing. I tell you now and then I'll tell you a little, a little excerpt uh, from my life. When I was a novice, uh, I, I prayed a lot. Uh, to be honest with you, I prayed more then than I do now because I didn't have anything other to do except pray. And that's a great blessing, too. And that was preparation. But um, I was uh, Wednesday night. We had a mass at this monastery where I was every Wednesday night. We had a, uh, a cenacle of uh, the Marian movement of priests, and we would pray, have a special mass. We'd pray the rosary. And... Um, the night before, early in the morning, I'd had a very strange experience. I guess, I don't know if it was a dream or what it was, but I was like going up, you know how you go up in an attic maybe? You go up in your attic or, or somebody's attic, and there's all kinds of things up there, you know, that people keep, you know. And, and I was going through all these things, and I found a trunk, uh, and I opened it. And I, for the first time in 20 years, I heard the voice of my cousin Tommy. My cousin Tommy White, who'd been a dentist and who practiced in Buffalo, New York. And my cousin's voice, just as clear as a bell, and I hadn't heard it in over 20 years, said this, we who suffer salute you. And I, and I, and I just was had an interior knowing that he was in purgatory. And I began praying, I prayed for him all day, and that night I offered my Holy Communion at Mass for him, and we were praying the rosary after Mass. And I had my eyes closed, and I was praying for Tommy, praying for my cousin Tommy. And all of a sudden, I, I saw like a silhouette. You know how a, a, a silhouette, my eyes closed, and it was a, a form of a man rising. And, and this smile came on my face. I couldn't prevent it. This tremendous ear-to-ear -ear smile and this joy came over me. I knew my cousin Tommy was going to heaven. He'd been liberated from purgatory. Sometimes, in battle, men are taken prisoner. It's an analogy, but in a way, some of us are held prisoner for a while. The rest of us can pray for those, those in, in prison, so to speak. Pray for the souls in purgatory. I'm going to tell you something, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart. You pray for the souls in purgatory starting right now. First of all, your own family members. But you pray for all the holy souls in purgatory because I'm going to tell you something. The day may well come when you wish somebody was doing it for you. And one thing that can ensure that they will is if you do it. You do it now. If you need it later, God will arrange to move someone to pray for you should you be in purgatory. And that's no disgrace. Everybody in purgatory goes to heaven. You get the purgatory, you've won, brother. You're going to get to heaven. You're, you're almost home. Pray for the souls in purgatory. Suffering. Redemptive, holy suffering. We do not appreciate the value of redemptive suffering. We don't even know it. If I went and asked the average Catholic about that topic, they wouldn't know a silly thing about it. And that's not their fault. That's our fault. I'm going to tell you how we could change the world almost instantaneously. All 
the violence, all the wars, all the evil, all the abortions, the pornography, the devil's stranglehold grip on creation, how we can turn that right upside down, how, how we can knock the devil right, right, out of the, right out of the box. I'll tell you how to do it. If we could explain to people, if we could convince them of the truth, to unite their sufferings with Jesus on the cross. If I could go to every hospital, if I could go to every nursing home, if I could ever tell every sick person, every lonely person, every depressed person, unite your sufferings to Jesus Christ and you will enter into power. You will set the captives free. That's the power of the cross. And the mystery of purgatory is wrapped up <clears throat> in that mystery of human suffering. My brothers and sisters, you and I, as good Catholics, have to learn our faith. Then, we have to live our faith, <clears throat> radiate our faith. And then that faith will set others free. <clears throat> That's how it works. We must do this, I promise you. If you will do this, if you will do this, pray for the souls in purgatory and ask them <clears throat> to pray for you. A lot of people don't know you can do that. They're part of the church, right? That's the church suffering. I, I'll tell you one of my little secrets. I have always asked the holy souls in purgatory to pray for me when I need very special help, when I have a very special mission that I have to accomplish, when I'm in trouble, when I'm being tested. I go to my coalition. I got one too, you know. George W. is not the only one who has a coalition. I got a coalition, you got one too. It consists of all the angels, all the saints in heaven, and the holy souls in purgatory as well as all those in the state of grace in the church. That's our coalition. That's a holy coalition. That's a powerful coalition. But I go to, to the, not many people go to the holy souls in purgatory. I do that. They have power. They're part of the body of Christ. A, an often neglected part of the body of Christ. I have regularly, since the day I was ordained, offered masses for the souls in purgatory, whenever I'm able to. Some of that, I do feel a certain uh, compassion for them. Uh, but I also know that it could just as easily be me. One day I could be in their place, and I would hope some priest would offer Mass for my soul to grant me release and liberation, to get me out of there and get me home. That's the only thing that we should care about. In the military, it's the mission that's important. Our mission is redemption. Redemption equals love. Love is willing the highest and best thing for the sake of the beloved. What I will for you is heaven. If you've got to pass through purgatory to get there, praise the Lord, because you're going to get there no matter what. And so what we're going to do in this coalition, we are going to pray for each other like we mean it. And don't let this go in one ear and out the other because I promise you one day I'm going to come and I'm going to haunt you. You're going to stand before God and I'm going to remind you that I had told you this and if you didn't do it, you're going to answer for it. Because I won't forget. And you got a right to do the same thing to me. That's a deal. That's a commercial transaction. You pray for me, I pray for you. You pray for the holy souls in purgatory. I'll pray for the holy souls in purgatory. They will pray for us, and we're all going to get there. We're going to walk through this valley of death. We're going to fear no evil. We're going to get home, and that home is heaven for all eternity. God bless you.